Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful to you, Lord, for giving us another opportunity, Lord, to come together to study your word. Thank you very much for your presence throughout the last week. You have enriched our spirits. You have strengthened our faith as we meditate on uh, the passion and resurrection of Jesus, true passion, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. As we have restarted our Bible study, Lord, I ask for your continuous guidance and leading and illumination so that we may be able to receive and perceive your revelation, O oh God, and may be able to experience it more intimately. As Pastor Dan is going to teach us today, this evening, I ask for your special anointing upon him. And you help us so that we all may be able to connect to the truth you want to reveal through him, Lord. And the discussions we are going to participate in, mutually encourage us and may bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and uh, welcome again to all of you to our uh, study. We are restarting the weekly studies. Anil and Rekha have just joined us. Uh, welcome. <laughs> and uh, I had given an invite to my brother Bobby, so we'll see if he'll <laughs> finally join us. Right. Like, uh, 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 let me see. Yeah, like uh, Pastor Praveen had prayed in the prayer. Uh, we had a truly inspiring week last week, and it was nice to have all our uh, trustees and uh, some of the members come join us for worship. So that was quite enjoyable. And uh, I hope uh, all of you, the rest of you, had a good time. Uh, of worship or wherever you might have been, fellowship. Okay, having said that, uh, today I'll pick up another episode in the history lesson, history of the church. Uh, we want to, well, we have, we have gone through, well, almost 15, 1600 years of church history. Uh, picking up some important things. Uh, welcome to Sanjira joining us. Thank you. And uh, uh, we've got a few more to go before we uh, wind up this particular series. But today I'll just sort of uh, go back a little bit and then come forward. And so as you have might have seen the title of the uh, the session today is History of the Church Science Puzzle. Uh, as you may have heard or read that what is the relationship of the church to science, scientific knowledge, uh, and uh, the sort of uh, the, uh, the, the way it is presented is that the, that the Bible is against science. Some people like to think that the Bible does not accept any, you know, reason and reasoned and experimented uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, they don't believe it's truth. Truth is only scripture for them. So uh, there are some, I, I would believe, some misconceptions about this. And let's see if we can uh, uh, sort of sort out uh, a few of those, if not all. So, all right. So let me just bring in this, bring in my screen. Let me uh, share my screen with you. Okay. Uh, okay, I am presuming you can all see my screen. Uh, and the title uh, is, is History of the Church Science Tussle and uh, Is the Bible Against Science? Now, where do we begin here? Let's begin, I would like to call it the origins, you know, um, origins of science and the scientific method. Uh, and so it's good for us to know how science also developed. And then when the church had to face this uh, discipline of scientific knowledge, then of course, uh, we will see the dynamics that existed between the two. 
So let's begin by talking about uh, the origins of science. And uh, as you see on the screen, empirical ideas existed among ancient Babylonians, Indians, Egyptians. When I say empirical uh, you know, ideas, empirical is based on or concerned with verifiable, observable, or you know, um, uh, fact. Verifiable, observable fact. Uh, it is it is different from just a theory or pure logic. In other words, the use of reason began uh, many, many, many years back before the church the church even existed. Okay, I specifically bring in Indians here uh, because uh, we like to uh, pride ourselves of having invented the zero. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so we would like to believe. Uh, we would like to believe that India also had, you know, engaged, and was you know there was existed scientific understanding and knowledge. Right. So moving on from these ancient Babylonian, Indian, Egyptian perspectives of empirical knowledge, the Greeks were the first to develop what we. Uh, recognized as the scientific method. I think the Greeks brought it more into focus, right? Um, and if when you talk about the Greeks, you cannot but talk about Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle, uh, who basically popularized the use of reason, or you could say philosophical, logical argument. That is, you know, the heavy use of reason. Uh, where science so very much depends on. Um, now, I, I'm not obviously there is so much we can talk about Socrates, Plato, and uh, Pla Platonism, and all of that. But obviously, I'm not going to get into that. But I just mention a, a word about Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, uh, lived 384 BCE before the Common Era or before Christ. Uh, he was regarded as the father of science, um, and uh, he showed the importance of empirical measurement. So obviously, he sort of made it much, much more formal, the discipline of uh, reason and philosophical argument. Uh, and so Aristotle was also, you know, looked up in the skies, and uh, he obviously made some conclusions, Aristotle reasoned that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun and planets went around it. So he believed in a heliocentric uh, universe where the earth was the center. I'm presuming that it was just through observation that he thought that the sun went from east to west and obviously the sun was moving but not the earth. I may also want to mention Ptolemy here. Ptolemy uh, also had an Earth-centered theory of the universe, and he further developed uh, the astronomer, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Ptolemy, who was an astronomer, you know, de further developed Aristotelian thoughts. Okay, so these were some of the uh, original thinkers or brought the scientific method into. Uh, into, you know, um, or rather I should say popularized. Let's move to our next slide. Christian theology and Greek philosophy. So let's now fast forward a bit and come forward uh, during, uh, after Christ and of course the beginning of the church, but just before, before Christ uh, and the church. Let's see. There was a man called Philo of Alexandria. Uh, lived 25 BCE, philosophy was considered, and he believed the philosophy was considered handmaiden to theology. You might have heard that quote. While theology was the queen of the sciences, that is what he said. Remember, Philo of Alexandria uh, was uh, very much uh, a, well, he had Greek origins, I mean to say, but he had very strong Jewish uh, connections, and so uh, he studied the Old Testament uh, very much, and he called philosophy, 
which is a branch of science. Uh, today, we would call it a branch of science, but philosophy existed much before modern science, called it the handmaiden to theology, but maintained that theology was the queen of the sciences. We'll move to Tertullian, uh, one of the church fathers of Carthage, 155. Now, remember, we have now moved into the church era, uh, 155 common era or um, AD. He proposed, uh, oh, let me see, uh, Tertullian, yes, Tertullian was one of those uh, who believed that uh, he was a Greek he believed in, you know, I mean, he believed that Greek philosophy that is uh, represented by Athens should have nothing to do with Jerusalem, which represented Christian theology. And hence the quotation, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Uh, so I'm presuming that the first tension between theology and science or the church and science probably began with Tertullian, uh, but it was a very mild uh, tension. It wasn't really a big fight at all, right? Tertullian's goal was to produce a purely Christian system of belief uh, that remained untainted by pagan, as he called it, or secular modes of thinking. So that is how Tertullian believed that you cannot mix philosophy and uh, theology. But we shouldn't forget the fact that he acknowledged a legitimate role for reason within the bounds of religion, right? So he believed that uh, reason and philosophy and the sciences have a legitimate role in the lives of people, but it had to be within the bounds of religion. So that is how Tertullian uh, concluded. Then we move to Clement of Alexandria. He was also around the same time. Uh, he proposed the concept of harmonizing divine revelation with philosophical ideas. So in other words, Clement of Alexandria, one of the church fathers, uh, opposed Tertullian's thoughts on the subject. We would like to believe Clement was more liberally minded. Uh, he was an intellectual. Uh, and he and he he also embraced philosophy to some extent, right? Tertullian deferred from uh, sorry, uh, Clement deferred from Tertullian by attempting to synthesize Christian belief with Greek culture, especially Platonism. All right, so that is how we understand Tertullian, uh, you know, in the equation of the church and science. Now, I didn't have place to insert. Uh, Augustine, but the Augustine of Hippo, who lived in th uh, 354 to 430 AD, so this is now 400 years into the church era, uh, must, I must mention that Augustine of Hippo considered reason a divine gift resting on the foundations of faith. Uh, Augustine recognized Greek scientists as reliable authorities on natural matters and cautioned Christians. He went to that extent of cautioning Christians against making nonsensical claims about nature. In other words, he was trying to caution Christians that don't read the Bible so literally that you make some these nonsensical claims about nature, right? Uh, one more thought about Augustine. Augustine did extensive work on the senses, classifying them in different categories based on perception and establishing that there was an inner sense which interprets and judges what comes from other senses. In other words, he uh, used reason very heavily and probably you could say was dabbling in the scientific method. Uh, one one uh, observation says that he contributed much to our understanding of reason and how it interacts with the soul culminating into epistemology, right, today. All right, so this is where the Christian church is accosted with, um, you could say, Greek philosophy and science as a whole, right, science. And so you can see that there was some tension with uh, 
Tertullian. Philo, of course, tried to maintain theology at a very high level, calling it the queen of sciences. Tertullian brought some tension in the two, but there was not really any fight as such. And that is something that we need to say. Okay, having said this, we are moving forward. But before we go into um, the uh, 10th and the 11th and the 12th century, I think it is fair for me to mention the golden age of Islam, because we are talking about science and the development of science. And there is a need for us to acknowledge the fact that there were Islamic scholars and scientists who did a fair amount of work contributing to scientific understanding and knowledge. And in this respect, there is something called the golden age of Islam, of Islam beginning with the uh, Abbasid Caliphate, 750 common era. Okay, so 750 common era right up till, you know, three, 400 years, you could see that uh, the Islamic scholars engaged in science. And uh, uh, as I show, I show you on the screen, Baghdad was centrally located between Europe and Asia and was an important area for trade and exchange of ideas. All right. The, uh, the Islamic scholars preserved knowledge of the ancient Greeks, including Aristotle. They studied such people as Aristotle and they added to it and were the catalyst for the formation of a scientific method recognizable to modern scientists and philosophers. And in this respect, the first and possibly the greatest Islamic scholar was one Ibn al-Haytham best known for his wonderful work on light and vision. And he penned a book called the Book of Optics. He developed a scientific method very similar to our own. All right. Now, uh, very interestingly, uh, the Abbasid uh, cal Caliph, one of the Caliphs, Harun al-Rashid and his son al-Mamun, al who followed him, established what is called a house of wisdom in Baghdad. Uh, and this house of wisdom was a dedicated space for scholarship. The house of wisdom increased in use and prestige under this particular caliph from 1813 CE to 1833. And what is interesting here is he made a special effort to recruit famous scholars to come to the House of Wisdom, which included Muslims, Christians, Jews, and all of these people collaborated and worked peacefully there. That's I thought very interesting and uh, it, it is worth mentioning. But of course, unfortunately, in the 13th century, these Muslims faced a threat from the Mongols. So the Mongol uh, conquest under Geng Genghis Khan took place and the Abbasid Caliphate culminated in the horrific sack of Baghdad that effectively ended the Islamic golden age. All right. Uh, Genghis Khan, if you remember, uh, had already conquered China. They invaded Baghdad and attacked the Muslims, destroying. And they just destroyed all the work that was done during that period, which is called the golden age. And that is I think a tremendous loss, even the historians talk about the loss of knowledge uh, because of uh, the sack of Baghdad. Uh, all right, so the Islamic golden age ended in 1258 CE. Okay, so I thought I'll just mention that because Christians were involved in it and I'm presuming the church allowed that. Uh, the church allowed that exchange of ideas and the, you know, uh, the cooperation of bringing in uh, this, this kind of learning. Okay, let's move now to the 13th and the 16th century, which is probably what uh, most uh, people will talk about. And this, this brings us to a man called, let's see here, uh, Thomas Aquinas, 1225. We are now into the 13th century. And this man, who was a very prominent figure in the Catholic Church. You remember now Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, they split back 200 years back. 
so the Catholic Church had uh, more prominence at this time. Uh, and he pro proposed the Earth-centric universe, which was propounded by Aristotle. All right. He was a modern Dominican. Oh, sorry, I should say moderate Dominican, who taught at uh, theology, who taught theology at Paris, and he integrated Aristotle with Christian theology. Right. Um, now this man Aquinas considered human reason an adequate instrument for attaining truth about the physical world. He says that if God could be known through his creation, right, then uh, there is nothing wrong for us to study nature and know more about and learn a little bit more about God from nature in inclusive of the scriptures. All right. And that became the church's official view, mind you. The church's official view was not opposed to science, but theology always remained queen. So scientific discovery, that any scientific discovery that had conflicted with Aristotle, you know, Arist Aristotelian view of the Earth-centric universe was obviously suppressed. They, they just, uh, you know, put that down. Uh, and maybe this was another point of tension because anybody who challenged the Aristotelian view was uh, uh, considered to be anathema in the church. Okay, we'll drop down to another man, which is, I'm sure, a famous name, Nicholas Copernicus, all right, 1473 AD, all right. Uh, Copernicus advanced a radical new theory of the universe <laughs> and uh, he placed the earth in motion about a stationary sun. So the heliocentric model was now being challenged. Copernicus proposed a heliocentric model of the universe in which the earth revolves around the sun. He believed that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the planetary system. And this flew in the face of you know, those who believed in the Aristotelian view because, you know, uh, they, they believed that earth was unique. God created human beings on the earth. And so the earth should be more sense, you know, more central to God's plan. And hence they couldn't accept the fact that the sun was actually uh, in the middle of the planetary system. But interestingly enough, the church didn't do much about this. In other words, they didn't try to torture him or uh, caution him. But apparently 73 years later, after Copernicus brought out his theory, uh, uh, there was a papal decision to censor Copernicus' work, uh, which was based on a conclusion that the heliocentric claim was contrary to the literal meaning of the scriptures. All right, so that is Copernicus. And very soon following him, was the famous name Galileo Galilei, all right? And uh, he is now the center of controversy that lots of people think, uh, but actually there was some misconceptions here also. Now, Galileo, what was he famous for? Galileo believed in the truth of the Copernicus heliocentric theory, and he began to teach it publicly, all right? Now, Initially, the Catholic authorities, remember this was the Catholic dominated area, Catholic authorities found this unacceptable and ordered Galileo not to teach this, this new astronomy. All right. Now, uh, but Galileo apparently was a very arrogant person and he treated his opponents quite arrogantly. He ignored the warning of the, of the, of the church and he published, in fact, a vigorous attack on traditional astronomy that is, you know, based on Aristotle, in which he thoughtlessly insulted his friend, Pope Urban VIII. And Galileo was then censured, put under house arrest. He was actually uh, brought in front of the Inquisition in, in 1633. And apparently Galileo was interro in, 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 interrogated under threat of torture and made to recant the heliocentric proposition. Uh, apparently he was sentenced to life imprisonment, which he spent in house arrest at his home in, uh, in, in, in Italy, somewhere in Italy. 
and he died in 1642. All right. Now there is something about Galileo which I will I will mention in just a moment. But I must mention another name here. Johannes Kepler is another name uh, which uh, may be worth uh, you know talking about. He was a German astronomer, and he found uh, Copernicus and Galileo's theory attractive for several reasons, and uh, and he sort of studied further and brought out the three parts of the Copernican universe. Apparently, the three parts in the Copernicus uh, universe symbolize the Trinity, all right? And this is how uh, he brought in his uh, perspectives. He believed that the central sun, with its emanating light, represented God the Father. The starry sphere, God the Son, you know, represented God the Son, and the intermediate space, God the Holy Spirit. Now, that was his theory. Uh, and, of course, he was probably trying to, you know, uh, bring uh, sugarcoat it a bit so that he would find uh, favor. Um, there was another person I uh, will just very briefly mention, a fellow called Giordano Bruno, uh, Italian philosopher, he was an astronomer, mathematician. Unfortunately, he was also an occultist. And uh, he brought out many theories, the theory of the infinite universe, the multiplicity of worlds in which he rejected the traditional geocentric, that is earth-centric astronomy. Uh, and in other words, he went beyond Copernican heliocentric theory. But the church didn't take uh, kindly to Kepler, uh, sorry, no, not Kepler, but to Bruno, uh, and had him sentenced as inquisition and actually burned at the stake. But the story is that he was burned for his anti-Christian views, uh, anti-Christian doctrinal views, not for his astronomical views. And that is, there is a debate on that. And so we leave it at that. Now, remember I mentioned about Galileo, and many people think that the church was against science because of Galileo. But actually, uh, a book written by Ronald Numbers, that's his name, Ronald Numbers, uh, titled Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. He says that uh, it was a myth that the church opposed science because of Galileo. Right Now, the church did not accept his theories, but to say that they were sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of were against science is, make, is, is, is taking it to a stretch. All right. Uh, uh, Ronald Numbers in his uh, book, he talks about 24 falsehoods, right, about science and religion. The most familiar, he says, that the church imprisoned and tortured Galileo, uh, that medieval Islam was hostile to science. And we just discussed about, uh, you know, golden age of Islam, that medieval Christians thought the earth was flat, that the church fought against anesthesia, have long been discredited. In other words, it is uh, not historical to believe that the church was against science because of Galileo, and Galileo went to the extent of, you know, being imprisoned and tortured. That apparently is not true. Uh, I would like to quote from uh, Mr. Joseph Dikac, who wrote on this. And this is the, uh, this is the following quote. Uh, Mr. Dikac says, the truth is that not only did Christianity not hold back scientific advancement, but many of the greatest discoveries of science were made by scientists who were Christians including such men as Galileo, Isaac Newton, René Descartes, uh, Pascal, Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle, Faraday, uh, Maxwell, Gregor Mendel, and uh, a few more names he mentions. He goes on to say, though not Christian, Einstein was a theist who believed in an intelligent, transcendent God. He once said, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. So uh, I, I just want to uh, sort of uh, emphasize the fact 
that the supposed battle between the church and scientists or science was an exaggeration. Yes, there were some tensions. There were censures. Uh, Galileo was told not to teach certain things, but to take it, uh, to, you know, to make it into a battle between church and science is, I think, a stretch. I would like to just also uh, quote very briefly from a book I was reading recently. And uh, the author is Professor John Lennox. And in, a, in his book, Can Science Explain Everything? He mentions about Galileo, and this is what he says. Furthermore, the popular simplistic version of the story about Galileo has been massaged to support an atheistic worldview. In reality, Galileo initially enjoyed a great deal of support from religious people. The astronomers of the powerful Jesuit education institution, the Collegio Romano, initially endorsed his astronomical work and fitted him for it. However, he was vigorously opposed by secular philosophers who were enraged at his criticism of Aristotle. John, Professor John Lennox uh, goes on to say, Galileo's scientific arguments were threatening the all-pervading Aristotelianism of the academy. All right, one more quote from uh, uh, John Lennox. Galileo also developed an unhealthy, short-sighted habit of denouncing the vitriolic terms, those who dis disagreed with him, right? In other words, he rubbed people the wrong way, especially the Pope, and that is how he got life, uh, life sentence, all right? So uh, uh, I will now move to now some conclusions as we... Uh, you know, come to the end of our presentation. What is the Roman Catholic view today? All right. And basically, the Roman Catholic Church has largely made its peace with science. In other words, there was not necessarily a huge uh, tussle. Uh, whatever little opposition they had towards science has now uh, been removed. Interestingly enough, a quotation from a very controversial figure called Cardinal Ratzinger, who was the previous pope, uh, he says, to that extent, we are faced here. Now, when he says to that extent, he's talking about evolution and creation. All right. He says, to that extent, we are faced here with two complementary rather than mutually exclusive realities. He's talking about evolution and creation. And so what he's trying to say is there is something called theistic evolution. And we don't have to oppose it. Now we can, you know, uh, try to understand it from a biblical perspective. He does not say creation. I mean, he does believe in creation, but he says that we don't have to oppose evolution because there is many Christian scientists talk about theistic evolution, which of course uh, we will leave it for Franklin Poppins to talk about <laughs> someday. All right. Okay. Now, uh, what is the Eastern Orthodox view? Uh, because we were talking mostly of the Roman Catholics, okay? The Eastern Orthodox view, and I'm quoting from a book by Andrew Dickinson White, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology and Christendom. This is what he says about the, Ro the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church, he says, it has never since the restoration of science arrayed itself in opposition to the advancement of knowledge. On the contrary, it has always met it with welcome. It has observed a reverential attitude to truth from whatever quarter it might come from. So we are given to believe that the, uh, the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church never really had any problem with science. So we come to my, the question I'd like to leave, uh, you know, which I had asked uh, in the title, is the Bible against science? And I think most of us basically know the answer, but I'll just uh, reiterate the point. You know, the very fact that God created us with a mind, a mind that could think, a mind that could reason, obviously, uh, he expected for us to use it, right? He didn't expect us to give us a mind and, uh, you know, the cognition and reason 
and then bottle it up and not use it. All right. So he expected for us to use the mind. And so uh, he also gives us choice. Even at the uh, in the Garden of Eden, he asks Adam and Eve to choose. He says, uh, do not eat of that, but choose this one. But he left it for the, the, he left the choice to them, which means to say he allowed them to reason. Right. So we could very clearly conclude God is not against reason, as we understand from the biblical scriptures. And if he's not against reason, obviously, he's not against science because science is undergirded by reason. The very fact that science takes place is because of reason and a mind that can think. In the, talking about choice, we can also say that God told the Israelites, choose life. Once again, he is, uh, you know, uh, very much talking about uh, the use of the mind, not the, not the abuse or not the uh, non-use of the mind. All right. And we also have heard this Bible is not a textbook. And that is where I think we many people who have a problem uh, with science and uh, theology, uh, like to read the Bible in a way that it's as though a science textbook. And that is wrong. Uh, and I think that is the unfortunate thing. In this respect, let me just uh, uh, read you one or two quotes from Professor John Lennox. I'm reading from the same book on uh, uh, page 31. This is what Professor John Lennox says. Uh, do we have to choose under the title? Do we have to choose? Why did Stephen R. Hawking think we had to choose between science and God while Sir Isaac Newton did not? Now, I must say that uh, John Lennox has written very stinging attacks against uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, and uh, he has taken him on on his logical reason, uh, the, the reasons that he brings out in some of his books. So apparently, um, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking uh, thinks that we have to choose between God and science. Uh, and he goes on to say, I think there are two main reasons, confusion about the nature of God and confusion about the nature of scientific explanation, right? He goes on to say on page 33, the key point here is that science does not compete with God as an explanation. Science gives a different kind of explanation. That leads us to think about the next defect in Hawking's thinking, all right? So that is what Professor John Lennox says. And uh, we do know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, one more quote, and this is from Pope John Paul II, a very interesting one. He says, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. This is a quotation from Pope John Paul. All right. And one more thought here before we move to the last slide. The heavens declare the glory of God. You remember Psalm 19? And obviously, you know, the the, the Bible was written in a way to show God exists and God is the creator. And there is no argument about that. But God gave us a mind to look at nature and indeed uh, be able to be in awe of this creator and be able to declare God's glory. And so uh, you can use God. I mean, it's a Bible to understand God and his nature. We can use uh, science to indeed understand the intricacies of his wonderful creation and to see how great indeed his create, creation is. I will end with this quotation from a man called uh, Francisco Ayala. Uh, he is from the University of California and he was praised for his view on the issues uh, regarding you know science and religion and apparently he also won the Templeton Prize. This is what he says, science and religion are two different windows through which we see the world. Uh, and he goes on to say, suppose I give you an exact physical description of a painting, he said. The physical description does not answer questions about the aesthetics or meaning. 
It has to be answered a different way, right? The physical description is like science and the meaning and purpose of the painting is like religion. For Ayala, science and God cannot stand as substitutes for each other, all right? You cannot substitute. One is totally different from the other. Okay, so I have uh, basically completed. I must say though, that uh, the real problem is not with theologians. The real problem is with the new atheists. They are the ones who are now hammer and tongs, you know, against religion. And uh, people like uh, Richard Dawkins says that we must ban religion. We must just make sure, destroy religion, because re religion is, uh, uh, of course, the opium of the people, like who was it, Karl Marx, or somebody said it. Uh, and so they, the new atheists are against religion. The church has never been against religion. It, it had its, uh, you know, issues with it. But I think uh, uh, to say that the church, you know, suppressed religion, uh, sorry, uh, the church suppressed science is uh, not necessarily historically, say historically factual. I'm going to open it up to any thoughts or comments you might have. Please uh, feel free to do so this time. Anil, go ahead. Uh, you quoted uh, uh, Ratzinger talking about evolution and creation. What did he mean by, uh, uh, what did you say? Uh, theist, what, theistic evolution, what is that? Uh, okay, yeah. Theistic, uh, theistic evolution. Evolution, <laughs> what, what, did, what did, can you elaborate? Uh, what, uh, you know, you know, one of the proponents of this is uh, Francis Collins. You remember Francis Collins? Yeah, yeah. Uh, head of the... NHI. Uh, what, NIH. Something. Yeah. NIH. NIH, whatever. Uh, he is uh, pretty big on this. And uh, he says that God could have used the evolutionary method to bring about creation. And that is how we can explain the earth being or the universe being how many? 14 billion years old. In other words, why would he wait 14 billion years to create human beings? And maybe according to them, there was something called ev an evolution taking place. And God is the one who has engineered it. In other words, uh, you can bring in intelligent design here, right? I think Stephen Meyer is uh, big on that. But I'm not yeah. sure there is some uh, differences between intelligent design and theistic evolution. But theistic evolution is basically God-engineered evolution. Mm. Right. Interesting. <laughs> but then has the has Christianity or Bible really uh, reconciled or, or bridged this gap between evolution and creation? <laughs> <laughs> That evolution and creation is a big issue. And yeah. the seven days of creation is a huge issue. <laughs> so these are, I think, uh, still battleground for uh, theologians and scientists. Uh, what, you know, most reasonable uh, uh, scientific theologians say is that the Bible and Genesis is talking of a different explanation of the coming of the creation. And uh, the Big Bang, if uh, people believe in that, is another explanation, which is a completely different explanation. But they can be complementary. They don't have to oppose each other. Because the scientists can never say, how did the Big Bang take place? What, ha what happened before that? No. <laughs> so uh, if indeed the Big Bang is true, then God had to engineer it, which, which basically means God created the heavens and the earth. That is true. That is true. And the other thing is the old earth, you know, that 14 billion, how does the uh, Bible explain that? Uh, <laughs> the Bible is silent. Uh, it does not, it does not uh, tell us because look at the first verse of Genesis. In the beginning, <laughs> what is this beginning? God created heavens and the earth. And then, of course, it brings in the, you know, the creation of uh, land, you know, the, the sea animals and the, uh, earth animals. 
Uh, was there a gap in between? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the Bible doesn't answer. Yeah. Our uh, resident scientist is not here, but I think, yeah. uh, <laughs> but Surya Murthy can take his place. <laughs> Hope you don't mind me making a little fun out of that. Yes, Surya Murthy, yes. We're waiting for your question. <laughs> or some, some light you can throw. Surya You're still, is silent. You're still muted. <laughs> right. right. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. No, now. I have no question. Yeah. My mind is very clear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Genesis 1 is absolutely scientific. Uh, say that again. I, I couldn't catch you. Genesis Genesis 1. Yeah. Uh, right down to the flood. It's absolutely scientific. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Some people might take exception to what you're saying. They might say Genesis 1 is more poetic than scientific. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? No, it is not poetic. It is uh, scientific. You say it's literal? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, okay. All right. So you believe in the young earth theory or the old yeah. earth? Young earth. Young earth. Okay, right. So how do you explain the skeleton being found, you know, millions of years old and so on? Or dinosaurs and so on. They are all fake. <laughs> See, it all depends on the, your radio dating carbon. Radio carbon dating. Radio yes, carbon agree. dating is... Radiodating carbon is not a foolproof method. It is not a whole I, Okay, I, I, I understand that. But, you know, it, it's not so wavered that, you know, something which is a million years old probably can be, you know, half a million years old or a quarter million years old. It yeah. cannot be, you know, what is being depicted as a million years old is only 1,000 years old. There cannot be such a gap. So yes, carbon dating has its fault, but it's not uh, to be dismissed that, no, that's, that's hey, rubbish. Hey. Recently, they have found dinosaurs in which the tissues are very soft. How do you answer that? Tissues are very soft. Can so, we say they were well-preserved? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Recent ones. Recent ones. Okay. You know, one theologian recently said that uh, Noah had dinosaurs in the ark. Uh, do you believe that, uh, Surya Murthy? Yes. Could be. <laughs> See, dinosaurs, Could be. Need, dinosaurs need not be of huge sizes. There okay. were dinosaurs of small sizes also. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, a uh, lot of speculation there, but, yeah. but yeah. Uh, doesn't clearly answer. Right. Yeah. Right. But my main point was, you know, basically to uh, establish the fact that some of the thoughts that were some of the belief system regarding the battle between church and science, somehow, uh, you know, I think there were some misconceptions there. And uh, I think we can we can uh, uh, you know conclude that uh, the church never uh, squelched scientific research and the scientific method. We we never were against it. In fact, uh, some of the priests in in Catholicism were scientists. Uh, they say that the Big Bang theory was actually proposed by some, one particular priest. I can't get his name. Uh, you know, many, many years back before the modern science talks about it. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, any other thoughts or views? Hmm. Otherwise, we can end.
Yes, go ahead. Sorry, Mat. As you said, there were many Islamic scholars yeah. who had done a lot of research into these matters. Yes. Whom we normally do not hear about. Right. Yeah, I think that is true, and I think we must acknowledge that. And uh, but still, I would think that it is the Christian Church that uh, probably gave rise to the Renaissance, and you know, the uh, encouraged uh, the uh, endeavor of scientific reasoning and the scientific method. And I think that's uh, that is something worth looking at. Genetics, genetics was started by right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, presence and attendance. Uh, I was also thinking maybe um, uh, somebody mentioned, and are you going to talk about the Inquisition? Uh, that was another, perhaps a dark period in the in, in Christian church history. And uh, uh, there were you know, lots of people talk about that and, uh, you know, they fault the church for that. So I look, I look into it and see what materials I can find. And maybe we can discuss the Inquisition next as we move yeah. now away from, okay. right, yeah, coming closer Actually, now to the 20th century. Yeah. And the Crusades also, the Crusades. Uh, did we not have a session on Crusades, uh, Rekha? You know, yeah, know. Okay, okay. I'll tell you what. If Praveen, if you can find that, uh, I think we have that uh, recording. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can find it, we'll send it to you and have a look okay. at it. And if you have okay. any, you know, anything to contribute there, feel free to do so because uh, that's another very interesting period in the Christian history. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all again and. Uh, Let's, uh, uh, I just have mentioned that we will now begin our uh, weekly Bible studies uh, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, there will be some travel coming up for me in June, July. So uh, I'm presuming Praveen and uh, past the two pastors can look after Bible studies. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure you'll get some rich knowledge from them. But let's end today's session. Thank you again. And maybe Anil, if you can uh, lead us in a closing. Okay. <clears throat> let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for all your wonderful blessings that you shower upon us. Lord, we have a lot to be thankful for, Lord. We know there are so many things happening around the world, there's violence, there's deprivation, hunger, and so on. And to that extent, Lord, we thank you that we are relatively blessed by you. Mm -hmm. And we do pray, may you please look after and provide and protect all people's God. Father, we thank you for this session of the Bible study that we have, Father. We thank you for the topics that we discuss, that we need to glorify you, honor you, Lord, and get a little deeper understanding as to what you're teaching us, what you're revealing us, Lord. So, Father, continue to be with us all, guide us throughout, and Lord, help us to be lights as we go out in the world. Thank you so much, Lord. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. God bless you all, and we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> yep. Bye. Bye.